Normally, I wouldn't give a toss during the first year's sorting ceremony, most especially this year when my sister wasn't here to give her random predictions of which doe-eyed kid went where. It had kept us both entertained. But now I couldn't help the familiar pang of guilt of not having her here. The only thing that caught my attention now, though, was the chagrined tone by which Black announced a late arrivée. Curious as to which first year would get the flack on their first day, I was surprised instead to see a girl who looked about my age, and it seemed I wasn't the only one to take notice as the whole hall quieted down to intrigued murmurs. There was a grace to her, I quietly observed, steps that were silent and sure, only slowing as she gazed up the enchanted great hall ceiling. I'd expected the look of wonder, yes, but hers almost looked solemn, jaded in a way. This only added to my curious observation of her, as I was sure majority of the hall's populace was doing, watching as she sat to be sorted. Beatrice was the name I caught from Professor Weasley as she was welcomed. I mulled over the name of this newcomer, finding amusement in seeing the old sorting hat flap its rims in consideration, half remembering how Anne would imitate its voice to make up her own dialogues. Contrary to what others may think, whatever conversation you shared with the hat was solely between the two of you before it let the whole hall know of your designated house. What transfixed me now, however, was the wearer's facial expressions particularly the soft smile that graced her features. It suited her more than the jaded one, an aspect I could clearly tell from learning to be guarded while trying to maintain a charming personality, despite the previous year's incident involving my sister. Whatever the hat said to her next, though, caused her smile to instantly disappear as she looked unsurely towards our table. Another Slytherin, perhaps? I smiled at that. It never hurt to find a friendly face in a crowd. The one thing I didn't take into consideration, though, was that maybe Beatrice's decision was already made, and I could only watch from afar as she took a seat among her fellow Ravenclaws. I hadn't meant to stare, really. It just so happens my eyes would gravitate towards her during the feast, noting how she'd lick her lips during a certain conversation, which I was sure also got the attention of the other boys closest to where she sat, or how I'd spy her silently taking in her surroundings, her wandering eyes passing by faces and ghosts alike, until they met mine from across the tables. I couldn't help but smile at finally having her attention on me, seeing as she returned it with a polite smile of her own. Though a little too polite, if you'd asked me. Although now I inwardly groaned at having to remember how Reyes and McDowell tag-teamed on teasing me about the new fifth year, right until we left the Great Hall. Ugh. Sebastian, I know I've been your only roommate since nobody wants to bunk with us, but please have the decency to use a silencing charm. I'm blind, not deaf. I'm not- What? I've never- I sputtered out of my bed covers, glaring at Ominous despite our room's dim lighting. You were thinking about that new fifth year, weren't you? I saw Ominous turn to sit up on his bed, leaning back against the headboard with his arms crossed. Not in that way. These were the sort of times I was glad for Ominous's lack of sight, lest my burning face be added to the list of teases I had to endure for the night. I found it annoying how Imelda and Violet wouldn't stop pestering you over dinner and don't get me started with the whispers. It was a cacophony in there. I wasn't expecting you to listen in. I quieted down, realising what Ominous just said. It was my curiosity that got the best of me, really. I garnered she was pretty. I thought that was the end of our discussion when Ominous now went back to getting comfortable under his bed covers, prompting me to lay back on my own. Well, was she? I didn't really get a closer look at her, but... I hesitated, grasping for words as I stared up from my bed, pondering. The least bit you can do is amuse me, Sebastian. All right, what do you even expect me to say? She's pretty enough for me, at least. Ugh. And it's not as if you don't have any sort of means to actually see her, you know. I choose not to, Sebastian. You know how people have a tendency to warp their mind's vision of someone they find the least bit attractive? I'd need to read someone with no biases. Ah, how could I forget? Ominous usually used legitimacy whenever he was frustratingly curious about something, though Anne had proven reliable in filling the gaps before. Hmm. <sighs> I pulled the covers over my head in a bid to ward off the guilt. Here I was, entertaining the thought of fancying a new student, when I should be looking for a cure for my sister. How I terribly missed Anne. September 1st, 1890. Ancient magic. To see what others cannot. A goblin seemingly unaffected by ordinary magic alone. To deem this all unrelated would spell ignorance yet. If I try to fight against fate, will the future of the wizarding world still end up resting on my shoulder? Be it mine to bear alone, 
I'm hoping against hope that this sense of hero complex may be left untapped. I still have much to learn at Hogwarts, and not much time to do it. 